Hey guys, this is Robert Breedlove from the What Is Money Show. And as you've learned by watching this show, Bitcoin is the single most important asset you can own in the 21st century. And one of the most important companies in Bitcoin today is NIDIG. NIDIG's mission is to facilitate financial security for all. They accomplish this by bringing a high level of professionalization and sophistication to the Bitcoin marketplace. As a true game changer in the industry, NIDIG is safely unlocking the power of Bitcoin for forward-thinking individuals and institutions alike. By using NIDIG, you will gain access to an end-to-end -end institutional-grade platform, providing Bitcoin OTC transactions, Bitcoin collateralized borrowing, secure custody, asset management, derivatives, financing, market research, and more. And all of these services meet the highest regulatory governance and audit standards. Led by Robbie Gutman, Yin Zhao, and Ross Stevens, NIDIG has absolutely exploded onto the Bitcoin scene recently and is leading the way for ongoing institutional adoption in this nascent asset class. So please be sure to check out NIDIG as a single source for all your Bitcoin needs. So what, I, what, what I'm coming to is a conclusion that, um, well, distributed cognition is more powerful and therefore has more powerful capacities for self-correction. It also has tremendous abilities because uh, of creating very powerful and uh, widely permeating self-deception mm -hmm. precisely because I think even self, even distributed cognition faces combinatorial explosion, faces the frame problem. Just because it's larger and more powerful and more self-correcting mm -hmm. doesn't mean it's, it, it, it's free from any of those fundamental issues that I talk about in my work. So um, what are your thoughts on that? How do you respond to that? Is that a fair question to bring up, first of all? Absolutely, completely. Um, and I think many great thinkers are talking about this point. Um, there's yeah. a great, this is, I'm just reminded of this episode with Eric Weinstein and Peter yep. Thiel, the first episode of The Portal. They start going into the um, pervasive institutional rot since the early 1970s. Uh, which I think might be related to this, but again, I, I, I draw the point that we went off the gold standard in the seventies. So I think there's a connection there. Um, yes. I don't have as deep knowledge, definitely not as you of academia. I've never been on, I've only gone through as a student. I've never been on the other side of the table, but yeah. my, my, my intuition about this at least is that this, um, distortion of incentives perhaps to pursue like you said uh new scientific ideas versus yes. dis disconfirmation right and right. versus um i guess interconnecting older ideas yeah. yes yes i would just intuit again i don't know anything about this that this is perhaps somehow related to the funding mechanisms that these individuals are pursuing when they publish these papers are they doing it with the aim of getting grants or funding of some kind? There, there is. And I did say uh, that um, I, I didn't want to identify with that, but you, you're right to correct me and say that, 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 that like I, I was trying to talk about something other than financial corruption. Yeah. However, I, I probably went too far uh, that, you know, the, 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 the funding process is um, definitely a factor. The problem with the funding process is it also faces the frame problem, which is you do, if, if we're genuinely doing science, and this is why it's not a deductive process, we have to be, we, we don't know where it's going to go. Right. Right. Because we know where it's going to go. We're not doing science. That's one of the really clear rules in my mind. Yes. Right. Yes, right. Yes, yes. Right. Right. And so trying to fund this stuff, it, I, like, again, I, 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 I hesitate to put myself in a position of judgment of people who are doing this. So, Certain policies have arisen to try uh, for funding that try to balance between stability mm -hmm. and plasticity. And I, I think they originally were functioning, but again, somehow they get disc decoupled right. from right. And, and and then and this is my concern. My concern is any system is going to get decoupled from its environment yes. over time. Right. Right. Yes. Okay. So um <clears throat> The other thought I had about this, so decoupling 
from its environment. I guess you could say this is the agency decoupling from the arena to some extent. Yeah. And then, the and then there's a correction. Yeah, there can be. And the corrections, yeah. right? The, the, I mean, so let, 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 you know, the Bronze Age collapse. There's several mm -hmm. theories about it. Um, one is, you know, uh, com, uh, general systems collapse, a complex system. I'm not so sure of, of, of that, but a very interesting theory, one that I think actually has more archaeological evidence going forth than Klein is Drew's theory. Uh, and Drew's theory was you have you you have these Bronze Age empires, and they have they've been in existence literally for millennia, mm -hmm. right? And there's been stressors all along. There's been drought and flood and all kinds of stressors, and there seems to have been a set of stressors around 1200 BCE. But the evidence seems to be that something there was a there was a there was a technological change, and it, and it, and it you dropped it into this complex international network, and the whole thing just became unglued. And when you say it, it sounds like it can't be that. Mm -hmm. But here's his proposal, right? So the what happens is you get the institutionalization in the way we've talked about it of warfare, chariot warfare, mm -hmm. right? And chariot warfare is dominant during the Bronze Age and it becomes progressively dominant. And you see the Egyptian empire, the greatest empire of the age, because it, what it's done is they, they have just, they have worked the chariot into like probably mm -hmm. its optimal form, right? Mm -hmm. And chariots aren't tanks. You don't ride the chariot into the infantry. Mm -hmm. Chariots are archery platforms. So right. they're right. designed to give you, you, you can move tr your, your archers around very fast, get them close, pull them away from danger. And that, that is what gives them their power. So gotcha. they're, treme they're, tr they're tremendous that way. Now, what Drews argues is what you see is after, after, the Bron after the Bronze Age collapse, chariot warfare is gone. People keep chariots around, but they don't quite know what to do with them. The Romans oh. use them for sort of in the circus. And Homer's yeah. writing yeah. about right, the, 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 the Bronze Age world. It's filled with chariots. He doesn't know after the Bronze Age collapsed, what you do with the chariot. He has like Ajax and other people ride up to battle in the chariot. You can see this in the movie Troy. Yeah. And then they get out of their chariot and they yeah. go and fight yeah. on foot, right? And, and he said, there's this huge change. And he, and he says, you can see all this evidence that because it wasn't the invention of iron per se. The Hittites are using iron tools. But what happened with iron is a kind of, a, 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 you could make armor more available and a new kind of armor and a new kind of sword come in. And what that does is it allows infantry to take out the chariots like that. Oh, interesting. And overnight, chariots, which had become the institutional, the institutionalization mm -hmm. of how military power is wielded in the Bronze Age, it is instantly, instantly made obsolete. And then the whole thing just collapses. Wow. The whole system wow. just unravels. Because there's as much evidence, the idea that there's the sea people and they invade, that's pretty much uh, disconfirmed by everybody who's doing work on it. Right. Right. There's lots of evidence that the, the cities were being destroyed by uprisings within rather than invasions without, because the aristocracy couldn't hold on to power anymore because right, it, right. it lost, to use one of your phrases, it lost the monopoly on violence. Right. Because right. the main advantage which is it, you had to be an aristocrat to own a chariot. There's yes, like, right. General Joe guy can't do that. But yes. if General Joe could buy some cheap, relatively cheap Iron Age armor and get a bunch of his buddies together, and instead of running away from you, they actually run towards your chariot and kill your horse, yeah. then it's gone. Okay, I, so I, go ahead. Well, the, the, that, that well, hopefully that was at least independently historically interesting. But the point I'm very trying to make, yeah. right? You have this very complex. You have literally not just civilization. You have civilizations, and mm -hmm. they are meta networked together, vast trade empires, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and it's this massively self correcting system, and it's you know it's been able to adapt for thousands of years. And then you get it's like it's like the asteroid. You get this like potentially if Drews is right. Mm -hmm. You get this one un unforeseeable change, and then pfft, the whole thing falls apart. Yes. See, that's so that's what I, I, I would like to share a uh, comparable, yeah, um, historical account. Actually, so this this is covered deeply. I've mentioned this book to you before. I think the sovereign individual. Right, they right. talk about the economics of violence being one of the main driving forces. What they call 
a mega political variable that shapes human civilization effectively. Right. So our ability yes. to project force across distance is what allows us to project our willpower on one another and on the world at large. Yes, yes. And so they share the tale of the simple invention of the stirrup, actually. Yes. Yes. That allowed yes. the uh, the heavily armed knight to mount a horse. Once yes. a heavily armed knight could mount a horse, all of a sudden he's an army of one on the countryside. You know, yeah, yeah. fifty peasants can't do anything about an armed knight. So this lead yes. this like contributes to the rise of feudalism. Actually, these armed knights, and yep. the, back to the cost element, the equivalent I think they say in the book is like this is like a one hundred thousand dollar outfit to get the armor yeah, yeah. and the battle horse so you know 0.01 yeah. percent of the population can afford it or whatever so that exactly. portion of the population comes to dominate uh the, the rest of the world that's feudalism what happens the invention of gunpowder yep. yep all of a sudden these peasants can take out a knight at 200 yards no problem feudalism yep. collapses the chivalric code collapses Yes, uh, yes. And then, you know, the church sort of brings peace and then it later suffers its own disruption with the printing press. Right. So this economics of violence, I think, is very key to how we organize ourselves in addition to, uh, you know, the systemization of money and social institutions. So, yeah, I just wanted to share that. Um, no, I, that's an excellent example. I mean, and then you I mean, it, and, and that comes to fruition with Napoleon. When Napoleon is the person who first figures out you can mass citizens together with gu with guns and they can overwhelm any aristocratic army and then he just he yes. just destroys the order of Europe. Um, so I, I think I, I think that's yeah I think that's well said. So so the over point the the, the point I want to make is um, I, I want to come I'm, I guess I'm arguing for uh, to come to some judicial judicious not judicial judicious appreciation of both the power of these complex systems, but how that seems to correlate with a kind of fragility that is masked by their power. Mm -hmm. Yes. Your example is just as good as my example for showing that, you know, here's this comp and it's, you know, it, you know, that the, 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 the feudalism spread, it's multinational network, it gets, you know, all the things, and then, right. <laughs> Right. Yes. Right. Right. Um, yeah. I, I, the fragility seems to me to be related to the. It's very pragmatic and technological, right? It's like how effective is this technology at influencing or corralling or controlling human behavior, and a lot of that does come down to the logic of violence. Like, can I impose my willpower over you? And this is based on. Again, I, what I argue is the viability of property, which again, if we understand property properly, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's controlling the time of others, right? The time and the things they spend their time in um, creating right. effectively. Right. So right. in that same lens, this, you know, and this is, ties back into the broader thesis of Bitcoin is that it's the ultimate defender's advantage. You know, it's an informational property right independent of the monopoly on violence. Right. very high cost to try to steal it and you can't even really steal it if you custody it properly you can't even torture me and get my bitcoin because it's distributed in a multi-signature schema i can't unlock it you know there's all it's just infinite number of ways to custody the asset that make it resistant to theft so all of a sudden violence is just not profitable on a bit in a bitcoinized world is a theory so um so I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm wondering how to parse that out a little bit is there, there is this economics of violence that shapes the world, but then yeah. there's also the, you know, the money system largely has to do with shaping the world. Um, well, I want to, but I'm trying to put in a third variable. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 um, there's a sense in which the world can, there's a difference between problem solving and problem finding. And in fact, uh, creativity is usually count is usually understood as you use insight machinery not to solve problems, but to find problems. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and the world has a capacity to throw up uh, a problem that nobody has, like, you know, you've got the iron allows for new armor, which, right, gunpowder, right? Yeah. You see what I'm saying? That these, right, that there's a sense in which the world is 
um it's 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 <laughs> I, I i'm trying not to anthropomorphize the world too much and I'm, so the language is really bedeviling me here <laughs> but we we can't like the world is constantly going to throw up problems that are not foreseeable by the cultural cognitive grammar of a particular mm. distributed cognitive system from that's outside the frame right and that's what i was trying to get at loosely with the analogy of the asteroid hitting you mm -hmm. know the dinosaurs have been in existence for hundreds of millions of years you have these complex ecosystem and it's right. it's managing all kinds of problems and then here's a problem that it can't right and then boom right that kind yes. of thing no it's an excellent point um and i you know i the other thing that keeps coming to mind here <laughs> I hate to be so singularly focused on like the money and economic side, but it's just what I think about a lot. Show. Yeah. Show so, <laughs> I, I can't help but see, you know, language is a frame, right? It's one frame we're using to frame up and understand the world. But, you know, as the old saying it goes, talk is cheap in a way. I think money is at least as, as important of a frame as language. Um, well, I agree. I agree with you. And, and, and uh, so I don't know if we've talked about this before. You know, we faced an extinction event uh, somewhere between 100,000, 70,000 BCE in Africa. It might have been due, due to a super mm -hmm. volcano. It's not clear, right? Matt, Matt Rosano has done some of the excellent work on this. And it looks like, and I think this is to strengthen your point and make it very deep. The thing that saved us from extinction, which we hadn't done before, was we created broad trading networks. Yes. Right, and that yes. gave us a distributed cognition, a resiliency, because yes. you're not only trading goods, uh, right? You're trading ideas, yes. and that was yes. the adaptive response, and, and that allowed us to basically get through. So I, I totally, th I totally think you're you're saying something like important that insofar as money is the the hybrid lubricant, we're now we're just throwing our ontologies together. <laughs> we're trading. It is. It is plugged into one of our deepest kinds of adaptivity. I, I'm not I'm not denying that. I'm not denying. In fact, I'm trying to strengthen your argu argument yes. for you right now. Thank you. Yeah, but, but what I'm trying to get at is I'm trying to get at uh, an understanding of here's here's here. I I I want to understand and, and maybe you don't and that's fine. But this is where my I really want to understand the capacities for very complex, highly adaptive intelligent systems like our brain to mm -hmm. fall into self-deception. And I want to understand, I want to understand the same thing at the level of distributed cognition, how highly mm -hmm. complex, highly self-correcting, highly adaptive mm -hmm. systems can nevertheless fall prey to self-deception, right? Because of the fact that they still also face combinatorial explosion, frame problem. Right. They, they, they affect the K2 events that can't possibly be predicted within the proceduralized machinery of the institutions, et cetera. Yes. Okay. Um, just throwing something out. So is it uh, the self-deception is a matter of this complex system selecting a frame and then performing reciprocal narrowing into that frame? Yes, yes. And yes, then yes. at some point, perhaps it discovers its misfitness of the frame to reality or the arena. Yes. yes. And then there's a, a cataclysm of some kind, right? You, like I'm thinking of the nine dot problem again. Like you're, yes, you're staring at yes. this thing, you're framing it, you're, and then you're like, oh shit, I need to zoom out and see that the line needs to be longer. Um, Cause I, here's my concern. And this goes to discussions I have with Jordan Hall. The information, the cyber information environment that has been part of our framing mm -hmm. of how we're trying to solve our problem, right, is itself becoming so it's complexifying and it's not it, 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 and it's accelerating the mm -hmm. rate of this. So, right, what what happens in what's called general system collapse is you've got a system and here's an unexpected problem, so it complexifies. Here's an uh, and, it, mm -hmm. and then what happens is the system gets so complex that managing the internal environment of the system 
is as much of a problem as responding to the external environment mm. with the system. That's the idea of what's happening in the mm -hmm. Western Roman Empire, right? And so I think Jordan Hall and other people are right, is we're facing a new problem that our civilization has not wrestled with before. Right. And, and, right. and I think this sometimes gets mythologized by people in the fears of AI. I think that's a, a, a that's part, it's a symbol of the, this rather than being the actual issue, right? Which is, it's clear that, for example, social media, which arises for all kinds of prosaic, you know, reasons of self-interest mm -hmm. and, you know, communication, it, it seems completely reasonable to do this. Mm -hmm. It's having a dramatically deleterious effect on, uh, on people massive depression, increasing anxiety, uh, it, it, right? And, 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 and we're running this, we're running this terrific, uh, unexplored or unreflected social experiment yes, on human yes. biology, right? And, 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 and so that's, that's what I'm trying to show is this is becoming as much of a problem as any problem that it is capable of solving. Do, do you think this may be an aside, but do you think there's an equivalent benefit to social media? Like, for instance, you and I are connected via social media. Most of my work yep. and ideas and connections occur through social media. Do you? How do you look at the, the I guess, yeah, cost-benefit right. equation of that? I don't, I mean, I do, first of all, I think it would be ridiculously false to claim there aren't benefits because it would be a performative contradiction. Yeah, like you right, said, we're right, right. using it right now. That's how I do my series. Yeah. And I was actually surprised uh, because, because when I was originally doing this series, a lot of people said, nobody's going to stay in for an hour and then 50 hours. And that turned out to be wrong. People right. were. Yeah. Right. Um, and so, but I don't know. And, and the point is, the point I'm saying is nobody does. Mm -hmm. Right. We're not, we're, we're, we're not. And I think this is a problem that we should be, reflecting on because if you know if jordan hall and daniel schmachtenberger and other people in that community are right this acceleration of technology psychotechnology and cyber technology that's happening right now mm -hmm. um is a new kind of problem that our existing institutions are not set up to address and yes. uh right and that concerns me because i think that problem the meta crisis of environment and other stuff right mm -hmm. and the meaning crisis are all bound up together in a really toxic and complicated way <clears throat> that, it's great i've that, taken this completely in a direction we wouldn't no, intend no, no no I, I i really appreciate it and it's you know kind of forcing me to broaden my own thinking about the topic um it seems to me, and I don't, again, don't have the level of expertise you have, but if the, the, what I call, what the Austrians call the free market, right? Which is essentially everyone exchanging voluntarily. So a okay. form of free exchange without coercion, that that will necessarily produce over time. Like it may make errors. It may adopt the wrong frame and whatnot, but over time it will optimally self-correct uh, better than any other system that we can come up with because you're getting by definition the input from everyone right everyone is exchanging voluntarily when we exchange voluntarily this is an important point too in austrian economics that is how we create value so every time you and i trade that means you value what i have more than what you have right you value hey i've got apples you've got oranges I value oranges above apples and yeah. you do the reverse and that's how we trade. So when we complete the trade, at least in our minds, we are both better off, right? We both right. believe we're better off. Otherwise we wouldn't trade. And right, this right, is right, important. Right. If we thought they were equal, we wouldn't trade. What's the point? Right. Why incur yeah. the transaction costs? So value in that sense is created through voluntary exchange. And so the more you maximize voluntary exchange and minimize coercion, the better outcomes you have at all, uh, overall. So um, at, a, at a systemic level. And I think that is, I mean, in my mind, that's the 
best way to clear these errors like you're still going to make them you know humanity is going to invent something that doesn't work or a, a nuclear power plant is going to blow up we're going to learn from it um but when you start to impose coercion or these institutions even that that bottleneck that information flow like the central bank i would say is a huge bottleneck on information flow academia is a bottleneck on, on information flow and i'm not saying it's with bad intent like they served a purpose originally but maybe we've just kind of outgrown that original purpose and so now it becomes more of a a hindrance um i'm reminded here i'm reminded here of nietzsche where he says like you have to be a slave before you know how to be free right like we had to sub be subservient to some institutional form before we could overcome it or transcend it so i guess my my um i think that if i understand you i mean when you say voluntary you also mean right the the, the, the habermas idea of voluntary right that like that what is that i'm what, sorry well habermas you know he he the, the, he tried he he he's tried to work out kind of a universal ethics given the necessary requirements for communication okay. like uh, right so if people are degrading the signal because they're lying or defrauding or they're misrepresenting right uh, like there's all kinds of things which all actually undermine uh, the capacity for people to make informed choice or decision and mm -hmm. so he's trying to get at he was doing it from the pragmatics of communication so right although you can individually lie to me if you were to just always lie mm -hmm. people are just going to stop communicating with you mm -hmm. right? right in fact if you mostly lie people are going to stop communicating with you etc mm -hmm. and then you try and figure out well what do, what do, how, what how, what cultural norms should we pursue such that we can optimize or at least enhance maybe optimize is too strong mm -hmm. enhance uh the capacity for the best possible communication not the best content but the best right. possible right. process of communication. Right. So I'm just, right. uh, what I'm saying is when I hear you saying voluntary, you don't just mean that people are choosing without political coercion. It's also that they're not being forced to choose it within a system, right? Where there's lots of bad actors corrupting it, right? Manipulating right. The machinery. Yes. 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 Yeah, I, right. I would say that this probably gets back to the economics of violence where, where people yes. aren't facing a threat or veiled threat of force. Right. But it also goes back to your argument of trying to remove the motivation for deception uh, mm -hmm. through something like Bitcoin. Yes. So uh, right now I'm just trying to draw it all together. Correct. And then here, here, here's the thing is like we used to have an institution. That's not even the right word, but let's call it that. No, we used to have a an ecology of practices and psychotechnologies that was the the mother the home the birthplace mm -hmm. of new institutions and that's religion mm -hmm. there's a cult cultists cultivate those are all share an etymological root for a good reason Interesting. right okay yeah right and so the the, the, the again I, I like my concern is that the place where we turn for the generation of new ecologies of practices new institutions no longer exists for us right. uh, in a pervasive way i mean this is part of the argument for the meeting crisis and so i wonder if i just wonder if we can get the religion for me is the place that simultaneously exposes us to it, it simultaneously homes us and exposes us to horror, right? right. And, and it's on the horizon of intelligibility. Um, I just wonder if, if without, because this is my whole pro, my whole project of the religion that's not a religion. I wonder without that functionality in our distributed cognition, if we have the cultural cognitive machinery for cultivating new social institutions and right. sets of practices right, that right, go with right. it. I, I and that's why. Oh, just, and that's why I, I'm I, I I I I'm expressing doubt, but I'm doing it with respect. I hope mm. I'm expressing doubt about the sufficiency of the market to be able to do this kind of thing, to perform this kind of function. Yeah, this is a, a very deep question, and it's funny you brought it up because that was one of my questions about the connection between psychotechnology and social institutions. 
Yeah. If, if literacy is the, you know, the OG psychotechnology is religion than the OG institution. Uh, sorry, OG uh, original, basically, uh, using okay. a little bit of slang there. Um, but I like the way you've described this as an ecology. It's not just, I was originally thinking psychotechnology, you put a bunch of them together and then humans form this uh, sort of emergent application called a uh, social institution. But what you're right. saying is it's more of an ecology of psychotechnologies, procedures. Yeah. It's kind of, yes. it's kind of a template for ontology, maybe even, right? We're a way yes. of being. Yes. Um, it's the worldview what, generator. Right. What I'm sorry. Uh, the worldview generator world and, and a world generator. a worldview is not a picture. It yeah. is a fundamental cognitive cultural grammar for running distributed cognition and doing this kind of right evolving of our capacity to generate institutions and new psychotechnologies. Yeah. One of the ways yeah. of thinking about religion um, is it is it was sort of the ultimate ultimate curator and cultivator of ecologies of practices. Hmm. And so what, what I was uh, picking up on here is your inquiry is to whether or not, and please correct me if I'm wrong, can we exapt yeah. the old wisdom traditions to a non-religion religion, something that yeah. could, uh, I don't know, a secular religion of some kind? Is that? Well, so, I mean, and, and, and I, I'm really open to a lot of criticism, and, uh, and I'm not saying that emptily. You can see criticisms that my friends Jonathan Pajot and Paul Vander yeah, I've and listened to some of those yeah made and I take them to heart and I respond to them in mm -hmm. good faith and so I, I, I but because I do not have a foreclosure argument I do not have an argument that says you know here's the a priori proof that I'm right this is how things are going to go mm -hmm. right what I point to is a pretty constant empirical fact of the rise of the nuns n-o-n-e-s people who have no official religious allegiance the massive decline of the influence and participation in the church mm -hmm. in Europe, it's also in Canada. The United States is also now starting to pick up steam on this, right, uh, et cetera. Now, those people are not sort of Sam Harris atheists or Richard right. Dawkins atheists. Some of them are. By and large, they don't reject religion because they see it as being false. They, they reject it because they find it is irrelevant. It is not providing them with an ecology of practices that is adapting them to two things. The world seen through a scientific lens and simply rejecting science with magical thinking is to There's be as word. bound to that worldview as yeah. the people who worship it. Right. Yes. So yes. that and then the pervasiveness of technology, I, I find it like I find it like uh, on the edge of absurdity. And I, I'm not trying to be insulting to my interlocutor. But it's almost Kafkaesque. You're talking to people and they say, I don't believe they're talking to you in this medium. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and they're using it to say, I don't believe in science. And it's <laughs> yeah, like, I agreed. Yes. What, what does that mean? Right. So, again, science, the scientific worldview and technology were not part of the environment in which all of our religions evolved. Right. Yes. And we see that they have been struggling with them, not very successfully, to become viable. I think they're bound to a lot of structures from the Axel Revolution that's actually preventing them from adapting. But and, and, and I want to be really clear about here. If you belong to a religious tradition and you are able to, within that community mm -hmm. to cultivate wisdom, right, and find meaning in life, keep doing it. I'm not telling anybody to right. leave. Anything. Yes, I'm not, I that, that is hubristic. And and because I have empirical evidence from one of my RAs that if you're in an established religious tradition, you're going to do much better at cultivating wisdom and meaning in life than if you're not. Yes. So yes. I believe right. people when they tell me that. But what I'm saying is the demographics show that is simply not the case for a growing group of people that are soon going to be the majority of people. They're already the majority of people in the in this generation. Yes. So how are and this is part of why the meaning crisis is happening one of one of the many reasons how are we going to help these people cultivate the wisdom the meaning in life and given what we've been talking about the new psychotechnologies and the new institutions that mm -hmm. are needed for 
this world that we're in that has these new phenomena, scientific worldview, technology, and importantly, the interaction between them that is ever accelerating in an incomprehensible manner for most people. That's my point. It is um, taken with the utmost seriousness. I'll frankly say I have no idea. I mean, you've now, where I try to always get deep with my thinking, I think religion is just one step below that. And I, I don't have an answer. I, I want to just share some thoughts though, that yeah, the purpose of religion, right? And I, I just want to share some that I, I think. So I think it is the most ancient social institution. I think that's pretty well. I've heard that uh, we were wrong in calling prostitution the oldest uh, occupation in the world. <laughs> shamanism is the argument has now been made that shamanism is the actual the oldest shamanism, profession. Right, the mediator between the patterns of action of the group and the world. Right, he was bringing yes. new ideas and. And so, and, and, and new and new states of consciousness, new new potent, new possibilities for identity, yes. new of thinking, metaphorical thought, etc. Yes, he was the judge or the philosopher for the group, perhaps. If, if you could take a great philosopher, a great rock star, <laughs> um, a great psychotherapist, and uh, a, a, a great doctor, and put them all together, you'd have sort of a the, you'd sort of have what the shaman was. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, the purpose or purposes of this social institution called religion, I think, I'm just, I'm not sure here, was to entrain humans to unify or harmonize their actions, right? So we needed kind of common uh, patterns of behavior um, and, and common symbology or moral code. And this is really just, you know, kind of like money. Again, it's a lubricant for exchange. So if, if I can trust you, or I know what you're going to do, right? Or we follow the same moral code, this lowers the cost of us building rapport with one another, developing interpersonal trust. Religion definitely has that function. And there's, you know, increasing empirical evidence and theoretical argumentation to show that one of the, that is one of the, that's sort of the Durkheimian function mm -hmm. of religion. And, and I, I think it's, it's important. In fact, um, Religion is basically your, your membership card to distributed cognition mm -hmm. insofar as you're tapping into the cultural creativity of distributed cognition, right? So everything you just said, but religion also, I mean, and this is, you know, you see great theologians like Tillich talking about yes. the constant yes. pull between participation and individuation, right? Um, yes. That's one of the ways in which I think Tillich is superior to, to Jung. The idea being that religion should, religion allows you to enter into it, like you said, it, it lubricates and affords, it structurally functionally organizes distributed cognition, mm -hmm. but it also, it also does something like, because these two are inseparable, right? Because not only do you indwell your culture, you, you internalize it. So not only does your cognition reach out through your culture, that's mm -hmm. indwelling, mm -hmm. the culture reaches deeply into you. We've been talking about that yes. a lot today. Reciprocal right? feedback. And so religion also is designed to help people. Uh, and, and I want to, I, I want to go further. I want to say that that lubrication is there's, there's both external and internal lubrication. If you'll allow me those metaphors mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and, and they're, and you want to, you want to properly calibrate so that they are affording each other and resonating with each other. But I would say there's a purpose to that lubrication which is exactly to enhance individual cognition and distributed cognition, to enhance our capacities for zeroing in on relevant information by making it more meaningful, even making it sacred, yes. in order yes. to solve problems and increase and enhance our individual and collective dynamically interwoven adaptive relationship to an environment that is constantly dynamically in flux. Yes. So this ontological canopy, if you will, sacred canopy, sacred yeah, canopy called, called it the sacred canopy. Yes. We're, we're calling religion under which it, so the purpose of which is really to decrease the cost of trust in many ways, which is yes. to also say we're increasing what we call this lubrication 
or improving the fluency of information between yes. agents and the arena, right? So there's uh, yes. accelerated feedback. So we can function yes. more as one organism in a way, right? We yes. can, or, and so therefore it's it bioeconomically more efficient this under this yes. canopy. So this, this is Go where, ahead. and there's something, a deep connection here, because now we're talking about decreasing the cost of trust is increasing the fluency of information under this canopy that's religion right yeah. another definition of money by the way is that it's a trust minimized asset so it's it too is decreasing the cost of trust right yes, if you hand I, me gold i don't care who you are i don't care about your background i don't care where you got it i don't need to know you i'm going to give you whatever it's worth right we just trade and we're done so yeah, the, yeah. the more effectively a monetary technology can minimize the cost of trust the more likely it is to succeed and it sounds this sounds similar to religion and there's the connections get weirder because money has a very religious quality to it just put, pull out a dollar bill and god we trust yeah. right there's this symbology that has to be infused and, and with that, the money to get it to work right it's a social that's not, construct that's not coincidental that that has to be the case yes right? and when you get into bitcoin world bitcoin's generating its own new religion i mean these Bitcoiners are zealous, right? The Bitcoin maximalists, they are full-blown religious zealots about Bitcoin. As right. if you touch an alternative coin, like you're corrupting your soul kind of thing. It's no joke. So there's yeah. something here. <laughs> I don't know what it is. And I don't that want to very good. I don't want to throw religion into this bucket of being like, oh, it's just a collection of psychotechnologies and kind of discard the sacred elements to it. But it definitely has some of these qualities that we can also identify in the hybrid psychotechnology of money. Um, and the, the one last point I want to say is that when we remove religion from our socioeconomic systems, that's when we lead. That's what uh, leads us to statism and totalitarianism and all of this, right? It's you can't get rid of the religion. But once you pull out uh, the ancient religion, all of a sudden you get the religion of statism in its place, and that has all these deleterious yeah, outcomes. I, I, I agree. I agree totally with that. And, and that's why I, 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 this paradoxical thing, the religion, that's not a religion because yes. you can't leave, you can't leave that vacuum. Um, right. I think the historical argument for that is very clear. Um, and so the idea is how can, but we also have to hold religion accountable for, you know, the, it's sometimes genocidal behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that it has also, you know, been a vehicle for massive, uh, self-deception at the level of distributed cognition. I mean, and again, people who know me know I have a tremendous respect for religion as a phenomena, and I take it very mm. seriously. But I'll quote Nietzsche back at you. When the madman goes into the marketplace, right, uh, the, the, mm -hmm. right to proclaim that God is dead, he's not talking to the believers. He's talking to the atheists. Mm. And he says to them, you do not understand what you have done by killing God. You do mm -hmm. not get it. You do not understand. You do not see where this is going, right? right? Um, so, I mean, whatever criticism I might have of Nietzsche, I mean, he's a profound thinker, deeply influential on me, right? right? His recognition of the functionality of this yes. is important. Now, I like what you just did a minute ago. Right. I, I thought it was like that was so cool. That was a juicy moment. You said they're not the same. Right. But they're they're not. But they're not. But they're not. They're not separate from each other. And yeah. that seems that that there's some kind of dynamical relation. So what I think like you, you, you talked about how it makes, you know, it makes uh, it's religions like this lubricant for uh, a, a social coordination. Mm -hmm. But, you know, mm -hmm. that's the homing part of religion. Religion is also exposing us to the numinous because it's mm. all, it's not only assimilating to use Piagetian developmental terms. It's not only about assimilating the environment to us. That's culture does that partially, but mm -hmm. it's also about making us accommodate to an environment that is currently beyond our framing. Mm. And so religion, I think, is it's constantly the sacred is both that which ultimately homes us, but ultimately takes us out into the numinous, which is terrifying and horrific right right and what it's doing is trying to continually complexify distributed cognition in a way not off here it's complexifying distributed cognition to more and more track and conform to the complexity of the environment 
right? So, did, that, remind, did that make sense? Sorry, go ahead. I was I just I, want to say, did that make sense, what I just said? Yes, and it reminds me of this, the toggling you described, right? Between yeah, yeah. generalizability and discriminability, that it's this yeah, interface yeah, yeah. mechanism that yep. it almost maps on to, I guess, our salience landscape that we can very much use it religion. To, yeah, you think of religion as our distributed cognition salience landscaping, right? Yeah, calling something sacred is a way of saying, right, is a way of pointing to its prominence yes. and its permanence. And notice what I'm doing here. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Yeah. Ultimate. It's permanence within our collective salience landscaping. Right. And that right. is deeply functional and, and indispensable. The problem is we confuse the sacred as deeply functional, indispensable, profound, with it being perfect and permanent mm. and complete. And that's when we go and kill each other over it, right? <laughs> We or, say mine or, is perfect and complete. Yours is flawed. We're going to war, kind of thing. Yes, we do that, and we also we 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 start to get right. We start to become instead of adaptive, we become defensive. Mm -hmm. Right, the system becomes defensive rather than adaptive, and that's also a tricky thing to say because part of being adaptive is to being defensive yes. to some degree. Yes, right, yes, yes. right. So uh, we're not we're not talking about simplistic things here we're talking about very complex nuanced things yeah but and that's and uh, and i i want to like I, I, once we say that about religion and the sacred and the fact that like so the nuns need that they need something like that but the religion of me the religion of just me myself autodidactic which mm -hmm. we're all trying to do that doesn't work for mm -hmm. all kind i mean it, it's going to work here and there but overall, generally, it's not going to work. And right? so it's got to be a canopy. Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's it, like it's like it, 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 it's it, it's like, well, I, I, I won't do that right now. I was going to do it because an, an, an I want to get back to the point. This is the point. Now, take that, take everything we've been saying about money and then you noticing their interpenetration and their non-identity. I'm, I'm not leading to a conclusion here. This is opening up a tremendous question in my mind about what, almost, think about them as complex systems and complex wave patterns. What's the mm. wave interference of the way money is, right, coordinating our distributed cognition salience landscape? That's how you've been describing it a lot to yes. me. And yeah. how it even takes on a sacred value. And then religion over here doing it, right? And how... Like, I don't know. This is an open question, right? Yes. This is yes. what are the complex patterns of interference, affordance, co neutral constraint going on there? That strikes me as like, wow, that that sounds like that somebody should be doing work on that. That sounds to me. Like, <laughs> I think we might be. <laughs> yeah, it's a career. So this, I mean, where I'm, I feel resonant with the idea of unifying and coordinating human action. Like, there seems to be a large parallel between religion and market slash money there and this idea of yours is this paradoxical religion that is a non-religion so we're yeah, almost yeah. like a meta religion right like like yeah, moses yeah. observing the people interacting for 40 years and then he abstracts the 10 commandments you're yes, yeah. almost positing like we observe all of these religious interactions over time and abstract what's useful and construct yeah. something new i'm wondering here Paradox is something that's very fascinating to me. I'm always, you know, yeah, all the yeah. answers to all the profound questions are paradox. Have you heard or studied or read about the the Lapis Philosophorum, the Philosopher's Stone, much? Uh, I have, uh, like, within the context of Jungian reflections and post-Jungian reflections on alchemy as another, by the way, hybrid, because it's both the, the Jungian argument is that alchemy is both a physical transformative process mm -hmm. and a psychological transformative yes. process. So it is properly both a psychotechnology and a, a, a kind of material technology. Yes. yes. And, and yeah. in many ways, the, re, your, the idea of religion that is a non-religion, the Philosopher's Stone was said to be the unity of opposites, right? Yeah, that, that we could discover this yeah. thing. And there were a lot of things about it. One was, uh, the principles of Christ and matter, right? This uh, 
yeah. perfectly yeah. truthful substance. Um, actually, they they call the talked about. I think Peterson described this as the incorruptible substance. The philosopher's stone would be the incorruptible substance that served as the antidote to tyranny in the world. And yeah, that, I don't, I don't want to yeah. get too far out on a limb here, but I have <laughs> written a little bit about again Bitcoin. It is a social institution. It is a psycho technology, hybrid psycho technology. It is a money. Yeah. And it is, it does exhibit the first feature that has proven to be incorruptible, which is its fixed supply of 21 million, right? If we just consider corruption as being non fidelity to what it's meant to represent, again, money's meant to represent time or energy. Time and energy are perfectly scarce in the universe. Right, 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 specifically right. energy, second law of thermodynamics. Money is intended to map to that. So it's as if we have this first incorruptible substance, if you will, in Bitcoin. And I don't want to say that Bitcoin is the philosopher's stone, but it is interesting to me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it does have this potential to disrupt the tyranny of central banks. It kind of has this unity of opposites quality. It's not a religion, but it's inspiring religion. Yeah. Um, religious fervor, at least, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. so I don't I mean, know. I, it, I, I think about it, that. That's great. If it permeates, uh, uh, I mean, I, again, I do not know enough about Bitcoin, right? So I'm not making you, so hear the if, if, it, yeah. if, <laughs> right? If, and then if it permeates, um, and given what we said about the capacity for psychotechnologies to radically reframe, transframe. Yes. Transform individual people. cognition yeah. and culture cognition um yeah, yeah, then it could be that perhaps we could turn it around then and and say it needs to become the philosopher's stone in order right. to perform the functions you want it to perform maybe that's yes. what we could and you you bring up the last point that's very compelling about this is that um again i think you called this salience discounting right where you're we're more concerned about things nearer to us in time yeah. than further yeah. austrians yeah. call this time preference Yep. And just by yep. the, there's a lot of factors that influence time preference, but by money that just holds its value over time, just a savings technology that, you know, no one can violate this opens you up to longer term planning. So there are a, a number of people in Bitcoin that document the personal transformations this is creating in people. It's like, just to be able to have a money that, you know, That's no cool. one can confiscate people are thinking longer term. You yeah. become more focused on fitness, family, community, morality, Christianity. I mean, I mean, I'm living this, by the way. I've been, you know, in the fiat world, I had some success and I was a much darker version of myself yes. um, versus where I'm at now. And I credit a lot of that to, you know, the study of Bitcoin and, and all the other rabbit holes has taken me down. So I, I really want to. First of all, I want to acknowledge and respect what you just said, and I, I take it seriously. The fact Thank that you. other people are reporting that, that I, I would love to study that. I don't mean like make you a specimen or anything, but I mean, I want to, I want to like what you just said, because the other thing, here's another parallel. Um, the other thing that does that, uh, that gets people to work intergenerationally, because what the thing is, you, mm -hmm. can, you also need to get people to work beyond their own lifespan, yes. and that's religion. That's what religions yeah. have done. The building of Interestingly, cathedrals. let me let me tell, uh, and, and then I want to show you how this things can be religious without people even recognizing it. So this is an actual experiment that's run. So you go into, so you, you, you it's called temporal discounting, hyperbolic discounting. It's a, it's a present phenomena, and and there, and you know there's an adaptive reason for this. I think we talked about it before, right? Mm -hmm. um, now you go in and you teach a bunch of academics who are, you know, are supposed to be the cream of the crop, you know, rationality. You give them all this argument, empirical evidence that they should start saving now for their retirement. Mm -hmm. And you ask them any questions, challenges, criticisms. No, no, no. Did this make sense? Yes. Do you think? Yes, this is very probably true. You come back in six months. Are any of them saving any money? No. <laughs> okay. So then you, what you do is you, 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 you try and find out what's going on. And think about how this goes into stuff we were talking about, about identification and symbolism. People don't want to look at their future self. They don't want to identify with it because their future self is close to death. 
sick, weak, and ugly. And who wants to be close to death with weak, sick, and ugly? Right. So what the experimenters did is they said, aha, and they reframed it. And notice what's coming here. We want you to think of your future self, not as you, but as a relative whose well-being depends on your current actions uh, and for whom you should have compassion. So they invoke a moral argument, a compassion argument, and they try to invoke agape. Uh, they come back in six months and guess what the people are doing? They're saving for the future. Wow. So all the argument and all that, like, here's the decision matrix. Here's the probabilities. Here's the utilities. Here's the clarity of the information. You get all that? Yes. Is yeah. behavior change? No. Right. Go in and you do the symbolic machinery of identification. Wow. And you can get people to change their behavior. Wow. That's amazing. This um, reminds me, I, I saw a therapist for a while. And I had this really bad habit or skill habit. It was definitely a bad habit um, of talking to myself very harshly, you know, right. little mistake. What the F is wrong with you? Why did you do it? And he just had me very simply talk to myself as if I were talking to my daughter. Yes. Right? Just imagine you're talking to the little boy. The little boy makes mistakes and what, you know, talk to him like you talk to a little boy, like you talk to your daughter. And it made a world of difference. Um, yes. Yes. yes, it's incredible. Yes. Um, yes. It reminded me hey, of that. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. The, the only other thing was the save. So the saving, I don't, and I'm talking to uh, a friend of mine, Jimmy Song, about this. But the idea that a sound store of value, something that you can save the fruits of your labor in, that cannot be violated. I know where you're going on this. There's a confound in the experiment, and you're arguing. You're, you're, you're exactly right. There's a confound in that people are incentivized to spend. That's your consumptive argument. Well, and I totally well that one, yes. But I wanted to also just draw the connection that when you have something that you can save economic value in, it it enables you to become again lower time preference or lower oh, savings discount. So you're becoming more the you're becoming right. more moral. You're, right. It's right. almost right. like the, right. the the term saving, and then I'm reminded of like being saved in the judeo-christian yes, yes, sense yeah yes yes you know yes, there's yes. some connection there and no, no no i like that so yeah. that the causation can go both ways yeah right right yes and that's probably the case it's typically it's typically when we try to solve the chicken and egg problem we find that what's actually going on is a dynamical system between right. the variable transjectivity right? yeah that that's really good i like that that's very good i, I think that 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 makes uh plausible sense to me. So now, now, now we're, I think we're, we're becoming friends. So <laughs> I want to, I, I, so I'm going to put this out because I want to hear your response and it's not mean spirited. I hope you trust me. Right? I do. So please, right. So Christianity has this main claim and this is goes towards the title of your show that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Yes. So what, yes. what would you, I mean, what, so you're trying to bring these two into deep conversation yes. and yet you get the, this 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 fundamental claim and like what do you think about that what what would be your response to that yes yeah, I, so I, I would again take it back to property right so we know property is very important basis of civilization um to take it maybe one level deeper i think property is the territorial imperative expressed as it's the way humans express territoriality Yes. Right. So yeah. most animals are territorial, right? Birds sing to guard their yeah. branch and all this. Yeah. We express pro we express territoriality through property rights. Yes. So it's a yes. very, very earthly animalistic thing, right? And I would also argue that's why people are crazy about their money at times. Like if you yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. you can do a lot yeah, of things yeah. to a person, but if you mess with their money or steal the money, they're gonna possibly flip out on you. Yeah, um yeah. so to love that. To love money would be a root of evil because you're, you're, you know, love, big, big word to unpack, yeah, but yeah, if you yeah. take love, yeah. which should be directed upward, right? Towards higher principles and things like that yeah. and direct yeah. it downward. It's what, you're binding your identity to. it's what you're binding your identity to. Correct. Like you're just talking about the experiment, right? Perfect. They had, Perfect. They had to love the future self, right? Yes. Yeah. So instead of binding your identity towards your higher self, this would actually be lower. But there's a bit of a paradoxical thing here because 
the sounder money is or the sounder our property rights are, the more we free ourselves from the demands of property, right? And money. Ah. So the more money I can save and the more reliably I can save it, the less of a concern it is to me, the more I can focus on my higher self. So I think it is that is if you point that love, that, that identification downward towards money and property, it is evil, right? You'll do, you'll, you become an animal, right? You'll kill and deceive or do whatever you need to do. Whereas if you focus it upward, um, you, so, you have a so different outcome. That's a beautiful answer, Robert. That's a beautiful answer, right? And sort of uh, uh, Maslow, actually Aristotle, kind of right. You 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 right. You take you you when you satisfy the the, the more basic having needs, you're free to develop yes. and call them being Perfect. needs. Yes. Um, so that's interesting. You're you're you. So uh, let me know if this is fair. You actually are proposing this because you, in a sense, want to liberate people from a particular constraint, the constraint of money. Is, 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 did I understand you correctly? Absolutely. And I would also maybe take it a step further and say that it is a platform from which we can elevate civilization to the next level. Sure. The, given the, all the arguments about functionality that we just made, I get that. Yes, good. Yeah. Well, and the you know the principle of inviolable property has been around for a long time, right? That's yeah, been. Yeah, yeah. But now we have a functional implementation of inviolable property. So it's right. not just written on a constitution, and we hope that everyone adheres to it. It's permanently emblazoned in code. You know, no one can do anything about it. So it's like a new scaffolding for civilization. That's really interesting. That's really interesting. No. I I continue to be impressed by the moral intent of what you're what you're talking about. Like what I, and uh, this is important. I don't want to trivialize. I'm not just first of all, it wasn't flattery. I, I'm not just praising you. Uh, it's that no, I can tell it's genuine, and I really genuinely appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, good because the theorizing without moral intent is, I think, one of the and I, and I mean morality very broadly construed, like mm -hmm. the aspiration to self-transcendence, right? The, 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 Greek, the Greek word of arete, which mm -hmm. meant virtue and excellence broadly construed, not just arete, what yes, we mean by yes, sort of yes, a Kantian yes, yes. idea of morality, right? Theorizing without the cultivation of character uh, or with, right? So I'm a virtue epistemologist. I think the best account of epistemology is virtue epistemology. Mm -hmm. um, and so... I, I want to acknowledge and I want to honor and I want to praise, you know, this deep, the theory, the, the way you are integrating the theorizing, because people could just theorize as an intellectual or sure. self-serving project, yeah. but you're doing it because like you are trying to bind it. And you've told me, and thank you for sharing that autobiography, it's bound to your ongoing project of, cult, of transforming and cultivating your character right now. And you hope yes. to be able to offer that to other people. Have I, have I, have I, have I absolutely. I, I, and it's, it, um, it's happened organically. I didn't like, you know, launch out with this mission. I just experienced it in my own life and I've been writing and talking about it. And one thing's led to another. And here we are. That's, that's, that's really honorable. It's really honorable. Thank you. Um, no, thank you very much. I, I it's, uh, kind of surreal at times. So I don't know, I don't know what's going on here. Like is because a lot of the Bitcoiners and I could point you to some people, if you, if you like my friend, John Vallis, he's really focused on these personal transformations of Bitcoiners. There's a lot of far flung like stories of people that have been in all types of darkness, have discovered Bitcoin, gotten their act together, raising a family, got fit, I whatever would, it is. I want to, that's the for me, given my interests, that's the part of this that I would most like to learn about. Well, we'll be happy to introduce you. John's an amazing guy. Um, and it just, so it's like one thing to see it in your own life a little bit. It's another thing to start to see it in others and everyone else is reporting the same thing. And then, you know, it was, which Bitcoin led me to Peterson. Peterson led me to this discussion of alchemy and values and all these other things. And now you see it in, when you get into the alchemy rabbit hole, things got really weird for me. Cause when I read yeah. Peterson's maps of meanings, describe maps of meaning book, which is largely derived from Jung's study of alchemy, talking about the incorruptible yeah. substance, the end of state tyranny, yeah. the personal yeah, transformation. I get it. I get it. 
I get I'm it. like yeah. pinching yeah. myself a little bit, you know? So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's really, and I, I mean, I don't mean this in any kind of, you're a specimen. It's really fascinating. That's really fascinating how all of those things were, you know, it's like there's a, a you know, a, a, a strange attractor forming. Yes. Right? Yes. Yes. Right. yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. It's funny yeah. you use that term because I was such a rational atheist growing up too. But this process also, I was, yeah. I grew up Christian, became rational atheist in my own explorations. Yeah. And now I'm like, how can you not? There's yeah. something that, there's something quite ineffable, let's just say. So I have, I have a yeah. great deal of reverence for that, which I call God, call it whatever yeah. you want, but. Um, I get that, I get yeah. that. So this whole, yeah, this whole experience has been very um, powerful, but um, your work again, there's a lot of, you know, you talk to Bitcoiners about this, everyone can intuit the same thing, but the precise identification of the causal mechanisms that are relating culture to money and religion, all of these big concepts and ideas, they don't yeah. exist. So it's like, yes, we're, we're, yeah. we've got the machete hacking at the jungle right now. And yeah, the yeah, work yeah, has yeah. been just a really sharp machete. And, and that, what you just talked about there, that, that is, I really valued that in our discussion, that attempt to try and build connections and new vocabulary, conceptual vocabulary, theoretical grammar, yes. getting those things to talk to each other. Yeah, very much, very much. I think that's very important. Yeah. And a lot of the, you know, we, we talked about earlier, the pseudoscience of Keynesian economics and Austrian economics kind of being uh, exiled from academia. Maybe a lot of that is what's happening right now is uh, Austrian economics is being reincorporated into our understanding of reality. I mean, there's just, it's an a priori knowledge system, right? It's as serious as mathematics, but it is the youngest science too. So we might be, maybe we're in like the 18th century yeah. biology terms yeah, with yeah. economics, you know? So that's happening as well. It's another uh, factor. I think, I, I think that's a very, I mean, I think that's a very humble way to frame a positive valuation of Austrian economics. I'm glad that, that, that was well said. That was well said. That was Thank very you. well said. Um, well, this has been, man, I'm like charged up right now. I've got chill bumps <laughs> and all that. Um, so where should we, we, I love this connection between social institutions and psychotechnologies. Um, so I guess, let me ask one more question about this. Yeah. So we've described the social institution as this ecology of psychotechnologies, procedures, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the thought I had, and again, I'm looking at the printing press leading to the wider dissemination of literacy and numeracy, which led to the basically irrelevance of the medieval church and its ultimate collapse, right? People just didn't but notice how religion had prepared for that too. Because religion had already, like one of the things the Axial Revolution did was bind sacredness to literacy, the mm. sacred writing. Listen to this word, scriptures, mm. the written things, mm -hmm. right? So like it's, again, it's, right, it's a bit of a, again, the chicken and egg, right? Yes. The fact yes. that literacy had been, at least it had been sanctified and, yes. and, and given a sacred status then also, right, also drives, you know, what's motivating people? What, 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 was it, what was the first thing they wanted to mass print? The Bible. Of course, yeah. Right? Yes. And you speak up, right? And the holy word, yes. right? the, writ, the scriptures, right? And so it, it's, it's both, right? Yes. Again, it's, there's this deep interconnection between them. So there's this long history that predates, right, the printing press. That's mm -hmm. this, this history of, a symbolic identification of scripture with sacredness that then helps to afford the printing press, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. then is also accelerated by the printing press. Right, right, right. Interesting. So it's almost, um, okay. So let me just try to package this question. That was very interesting though. When the psychotechnology becomes either more refined or more yeah. widely disseminated, we can get into a circumstance where the social institution that maybe even enabled it 
or or nurtured it or you know because the before the uh again before the invention of the printing press the church was handling the reproduction of books in the bible right so it was necessary to get to the printing press ultimately but then it it birthed the very thing that disrupted yeah. it longer term yes. Yes. so is this and i'm trying to think of this through a technolo technological lens is this uh social revolution or or institutional collapse is this a form of collective software update in a way that people are just adopting new softwares and therefore they organize themselves under new institutional canopies yeah i think i mean that that's uh, again all the important caveats about the software metaphor in place yeah I, I think what happens is you you make possible networks of distributed cognition that's clearly what happens that aren't that weren't possible before and one of the things they start to do, one of the problems they start to solve immediately is, right, th th their self-formulation. Well, what are we? How do we work? How, like, yeah. right? And, and, and then so you get, you get this new powerful machine that tries to understand itself. And of course, when it understands, in, in it, and, and don't be too anthropomorphic here, right? But it's trying to sure, understand sure. itself. And, and as it's trying to understand itself, of course, that means it's going to understand other distributed cognitive networks by comparison mm -hmm. and contrast. And then you, right. And then, yeah, it's, it's very much going to start to potentially, at least, I don't want to make it sound teleological, but there's a tremendous potential for it to begin to differentiate itself from its birthing distributed cognitive uh, network matrix. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah that makes, it, that it, makes it, sense. No, it does. It does. And again, I'm picking up, Another thing I've really gotten from you is the metaphor and language. Like almost yeah, anytime yeah. I'm listening now, I'm how, the metaphors and you hit yeah. understand. So it's like this social institution is in a way trying to understand its purpose. Yes. And if it yeah. creates something that's closer to that purpose, maybe like going from the church to the printing press, which it was just to preserve and proliferate this, you know, psychotechnology of literacy in a way yeah. that it can create something that disrupts itself. Yes. It, let's do the etymology because uh, I did, right? The original etymology, although for us it's understand and we use understand metaphors. Yes. Yes. The, the original meaning is interstand, to stand, like it's to enter a field of distributed cognition. That's ah. the original meaning of the term. Interesting. So to see the world to the eyes of others. Basically. Yeah. Uh, the idea that understanding is ultimately done between people. Yes only derivatively within a person yes we used to have a virtue of being an understanding person which doesn't mm. mean that you've understood a lot it means you have the particular capacity to afford right understand un like communication and connecting and communing between mm -hmm. people yeah that makes sense um yeah you know i was thinking about this too is it again in the wake of psychotechnology it's like almost as if all human interaction is we're swapping components of this software right we're we're speaking yeah. through it but we're also like the maybe the mode of thinking right this little or this little thought yeah. module that i have i'm kind of throwing it over to you you're spinning it around snapping a few modules on and throwing it back and that's yes dialogue and yes. at some points, occasionally, we have a breakthrough, right? Like, oh, we put this thing together this way, and then let's publish it, and then it just totally updates everyone. Yeah, I, I think that's very much what's going on. I'm trying to, with the help of Christopher Master Pietro and Guy Senstock and Peter Lindbergh and, and Jordan Hall, uh, and, you know, a lot of people, I'm trying to combine the best cognitive science and the best history to try and say, but how, how can we get, how can we create an ecology of practices that affords that kind of, well, like that mutual system upgrade, yes. uh, the co-emergence where you yes. and I get, both get to a place of greater understanding that we couldn't have got to on our own. And not only the understanding of the ideas or reality, but the understanding of each other. This is the whole dialectic into the Logos project right. that, I, I, that I'm working on right now. Because I see that as part of what's going to be needed um, in, you know, the, again, again, take this with a grain of salt, the religion that's not a religion, about how can we, 
how can we afford people some of the deep and properly revered functionality that was present in religion um, that without binding them to a, a questionable to a metaphysics, or, 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 right? A questionable yeah. metaphysics or dogma, social policies, procedures mm -hmm. that they no longer find relevant or viable in their lives. Interesting.